Today I'm going to give you two presentations. First will be about reproducible data science. The second part will be something more similar to live coding. We will talk about explaining why classifier gives such an action or not another. So uh, first of all, my name is Norbert. Uh, I'm a PhD student. I just started this semester. My research, my research area is mainly about learning classifier systems. Uh, second, I own a private limited company part prediction and I specialize mainly in those technologies uh, below Java, Python, Groovy, Docker, Amazon Web Services. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you about in the next uh, 30 minutes. We will going to learn why it is important to assure that our data science is reproducible. We will analyze four aspects of it, the code, documentation, infrastructure, some data pipelines, and finally, I will give you a checklist. So why do, you need, uh, why do we need reproducibility in data science? Imagine the following scenario. Your boss told you to do a project. You do it, everything uh, works perfectly fine. And later, six months later, you are asked to reproduce it. And something happened along the way. For example, you have upgraded your operating systems. You thought that it would be easy operation, but unfortunately it is not. Some packages were updated and everything, everything needs to be corrected accordingly. You waste too much time. Second example from the academic area is that a lot of research papers have some simulation or experimentation section. Sometimes authors uh, did a great job. They produce their own libraries, perform experiments, and the other's job is to reproduce those experiments. Sometimes it takes up to 80 to 90% to do exactly the same what was done earlier before. And we also want to avoid this because we don't want to waste so much time. So what are the main reasons? We want to assure the results are deter deterministic across many runs of our uh, experiment or, or algorithm. We want to redo the, the same analysis after a, some period of time. We want to check if the new factor or something new we introduce uh, gives us some improvements, or maybe we just want to have some more efficient teamwork. So first, let's begin with assuring that the code uh, is high quality. We'll go through uh, four aspects. First of all, we will analyze, uh, we'll see if the code is written in clean code manners. We'll see, we'll see if it is versioned. Maybe we can apply some continuous integration and we have to assure that the random numbers are uh, initialized with, the, some, with some seed. If you work with software, you probably have gone through this book if not, it's a must-read topic for every software developer. It's a clean code written by Robert C. Martin. And in this book, he takes, uh, he introduces how important it is to introduce some uh, naming conventions, function, line numbers. He tells us to focus on readability because our code is finally read by human and it needs to be done good. If you don't want to go through this book because it's about 400 pages long, I recommend you a good video course on O'Reilly Media. If you will watch at least five minutes of it, you will gonna watch the whole series because the author is very charismatic and I strongly recommend to you. And he has also his private blog, 8 Light blog, on the soft, uh, where he focuses on the good practices in software development. Another nice tip is that in your project, you can include some special file called .editor.config file. It's a project whose uh, aim is to guarantee that there is the same convention across various uh, files uh, recognized by its extension. For example, you can assure that the Python files, all Python files in the projects are formatted in the same way. The nice feature of that is that it integrates automatically with most popular IDEs and in this way you can assure that the project within all team members 
works exactly this uh, looks like looks exactly the same. Uh, another aspect uh, you are probably using is version controlling system, because we all know that the changes are made uh, and we want to review something that happened before. This is uh, how it should not be done. Uh, actually, it's it's a slide from Perforce presentation. Uh, what is recommended is probably right here everybody uses some decentralized uh, version control system like Git. These are free public uh, available solution, most popular GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. Uh, it is worth mentioning that in Bitbucket and GitLab you have unlimited number of private repositories that you can use. It's their feature while GitHub is most popular one. Uh, you can al also try to introduce some continuous integration into your projects. Uh, data projects are specific, so probably you won't have some integration test or something there, but it's a nice place to introduce, for example, code linters when you can analyze the syntax of your, fi of your files or to do just uh, some basic smoke tests. And here also you can use the public uh, free available free free software available for public projects Travis CI or if you have access uh, to your own machine you can use Jenkins and remember also if you are working with uh, code to always initialize uh, random seed numbers here is the example of setting a random seed number in NumPy on the left and on the scikit-learn package on the right there are different naming conventions. There is seed, here is random state. It is important because across different run, it will assure that we will have the same results. So, so after the code uh, part, it is time to talk about documentation. It's a good practice to always include a readme file in, inside the project directory and to use some notebook software. Notebook, notebooks are good because they allows, allows us to mix uh, markdown for explaining what we, ha what we are doing and the code. Therefore, they are good for storytelling. They, are, they have ability to include graphics. Uh, and what is really important is that you can use them with different interpreters. For example, uh, with uh, one engine uses Python, the other R, or you can use uh, Apache Spark. And uh, the, most, uh, the most popular two choices are IPython Jupyter. Here is the screenshot if nobody uh, hasn't seen it before. And Apache Zeppelin. Personally, I prefer working with uh, Jupyter notebooks. Okay, so now the infrastructure provisioning. As I mentioned before, uh, our software changes, dependencies evolved over time, authors are adding new commits. Uh, sometimes the architecture of our solution is so sophisticated that it is very hard for others to reproduce what we have done. They have to install so many libraries, so many projects, connect them in a certain way. It is very, very hard. So we want to avoid this situation when everybody's uh, telling, oh no, I cannot do it, uh, it worked on your machine, it doesn't work on mine, do something with it. So there are, there are a couple possible ways how we can assure reproducible infrastructure. For Python projects, uh, most common way is to use virtual environments. Personally, I think I have done it only once in my life. Uh, second option is to use virtual machines and third, Docker containers. Each solution has its own advantages and disadvantages. For example, virtual environments. Uh, in my opinion, it's the hassle to keep track of all, all the environments, switch constantly between one and another. And the main drawback of them is that they are bind to specific operating system and Python version. You cannot easily say, hey, now I am using Python 2.7 and then I want to check if the same works on 3.5 easily. On the other hand, we have virtual machines. They are fully reproducible, but the problem with them is that they are really heavyweight for you and uh, therefore hard to maintain and to version. And in my opinion, the most uh, 
most easy to use way most easy to use way is to use Docker because they are really lightweight. They are easy to customize, maintain, version. Uh, you can create very sophisticated technology stacks with them. But the problem with this solution is that the, that there is very rapidly evolving. Some uh, Docker file definitions that I wrote two months ago now are deprecated because authors constantly keep to introduce new changes, new changes, so you need to adapt very fast. And it is still not the perfect solution for storing data. There are very, very various uh, concerns that the Docker failed at production when there was some MySQL or Elasticsearch container storing data because it wasn't uh, playing very good with the underlying file system. So, uh, what uh, does it look like to develop data projects within Docker? First of all, we have to distinguish two parts. There is image and the container. Image describes how the container, the environment for the container. You can use public images that you can find on Docker Hub. There are plenty of them, official images of various software. Or if you, if you need some sophisticated solution, you can write your own Docker file. Here is the example of the Docker file I wrote. There is specific syntax uh, telling me that I'm using Python 3.5 and I'm executing a serial of commands, installing required software and define default action that will execute when I run the container. And how we can run scripts in this uh, image? We can uh, pass them to the container as an argument or we can configure our IDE to use this uh, this container as an interpreter. This feature is available in PyCharm. Okay, uh, how to run this? If we have such a Docker file, we have to first build it. This is the command that will build the Docker file located in the current directory and name it like this. This will run the container. After executing this command, we will gain access to the shell with all the installed libraries. And we can also push this uh, image to the public repository and make it available for everyone to use. Of course, it is a good practice not to push our very secure images into public repository because everyone will have access to them. It is possible to set up a private cloud for that. If we want some more com sophisticated, more complicated architecture, we can use something called Docker Compose. Uh, for example, uh, this is a hypothetical scenario. We need to transfer data from MySQL to Elasticsearch, do some pre-processing and later visualize with Kibana. Everything has very... Uh, every, every component can change. Every component has very specific version assigned to it. With Docker Compose, you can specify each container as a service. With exact, with exact versions, with exact ports, environment variables, and connect relations to them. After you have done this, you can spin the whole stack by executing just one command, docker compose app. It will cause the docker engine to take care of all the running containers, managing data and connections between them. You don't need to waste any time by worrying about uh, running this on Linux, Windows, or Mac OS, every, everywhere it will work exactly the, in the same way. Okay, the last part will be about data pipelines. Uh, why do we need data pipelines? Because a lot of uh, common um, data, data analytics, data science projects work in a very similar manner. We have to pull data from somewhere, do something with them, and probably publish a report or some visualization. You have probably used uh, some data pipelines written on your own, for example, Shell and Python scripts. There is a tool called AWS Data Pipeline for managing data pipelines created within Amazon architecture. Uh, and there are two tools call, called Drake and Luigi. Uh, I want to uh, talk about the previous one because you probably know them. Uh, creating data pipelines in Shell and Python have this disadvantage that you are creating a set of steps, st set of steps, declaratives, and the problem with them is that one step fails, probably the next step 
won't run. Or if you have to rerun the whole analysis, it will go from the beginning. These problems are solved with Drake and Luigi. Drake is, uh, is an open source project uh, describing itself make for data. It is using bash commands to create uh, some instructions, tasks, and have some intelligency built into that allows us to intelligently rebuild the, the whole pipeline after a failure. Luigi does almost the same, with except that it is written in Python. You don't have to worry about all those commands uh, in Bash uh, for processing data. And uh, another feature is that it can take input from various sources of data, for example, Hadoop, Postgres databases, and like that. So uh, this is the checklist. Uh, I will give you this on paper after the presentation that you can use uh, that will remind you what's important after all. So first of all, I, we have to assure is the coding style clean, if we are using a version control system or continuous integration, if we have set up the generators for random numbers, if we are using uh, some notebooks for data analysis, is the infrastructure easy, easy to set up? Uh, ideally, if it would be if we had only one command to set the whole thing up. If we are using makefile for most commonly used commands, uh, if we are using any data pipelines, and if, as I said, is there is only one command to run the whole analysis. It will, about, it will be about predicting uh, explaining why the classifier choose such an action. Yes. Okay. This is a Jupyter Notebook. I have prepared. I will put it online uh, if someone would like to do the same after, uh, after this presentation. And uh, first of all, uh, why? Why are we doing this? Uh, as you know, nowadays we have very, ma very vast majority of quite accurate classifiers, random forest, super vector machine, deep learning models. They are easily accessible and very tempting for immediate use. Unfortunately, very often business requirements prevent from deploying such sophisticated algorithms due to the fact that there is no easy way of explaining why the, why the algorithm chooses such an action. It's a business requirement sometimes uh, to explain to the customer why there is a rejection or some other reason. Even though, so even though better methods are available, uh, companies often tend to stick with decision trees or simple association rules. So there is quite a new open source project called Lime that deals with this issue. It is able to explain any black box classifier that outputs two or more classes. All the requirement is that the classifier must implement a function that takes in uh, row text or numpy array and outputs uh, predicted probabilities for each class. So, for example, scikit-learn uh, fits here, fits in very good. Uh, how it works be behind the scenes, uh, as I read in documentation, it fits locally some inter interpretable model around predictions, and later on it uses some mathematical optimizations. So, what we will go through is, we are going to see how it works with continuous data, categorical data, and mix of them, numerical and categorical data. So, first of all, we are importing some required libraries. We are using NumPy, some scikit-learn uh, packages, uh, functions like loading IRS, uh, training, uh, splitting data set into train test parts, dealing with features, uh, random forest classifier, basic accuracy metric. We'll also use XGBoost classifier, and uh, Lime Explainer. We are also setting seed for reproducibility. 
Okay, so first, uh, how it works with continuous data. We are going to use uh, famous IRIS data divided into two sets, train and test with 0.8 ratio. And we are going to fit a random forest classifier with default parameters uh, using 500 trees. Make some predictions on the test. As you can see, we are obtaining 97% accuracy. And right now we are ready to create a Lime Explainer. Lime Explainer is an object taking in our training data and some other uh, things like feature names, classes names, uh, etc. It, it needs this to compute st statistical features on each uh, statistical metrics on each feature. Later, we can use this explainer to predict. Um, okay. okay. Uh, later, we are going to take randomly one candidate from our test dataset and try to explain why there was such an action chosen and render the output in the notebook. Okay, for this example, uh, for this instance, it is 99% uh, uh, Virginica, our, our algorithm told so. Here are the reasons uh, for not being Virginica, here are pros, and these are the features used. As you can see, different color on different features uh, shows the reason why there was such a decision. These first three features are uh, pro this decision and the other is not. We can try to uh, run this algorithm a couple times. For example, here the class is predicted 100% Satosa and all features uh, agree to this. Oh, uh, here is an, another example where, where the classifier is not perfectly sure. You can change here uh, how many features will be used for making explanation. Here I am using all four features. We can change it to only, for example, two. And we can analyze not only the top class, but uh, other probabilities for other classes. Here we are analyzing it for Virginica and Versicolor, and also have the information about features. Okay. Uh, now let's see how it works with categorical data. I have used the mushroom dataset from the UCI repository. The task is to predict whether a mushroom is edible or poisonous. Here is the code for loading uh, data from the text file and pre-processing it. I know it's, it's not very clean, but it works. Okay, it has run. Uh, this is how the data looks like. Uh, this is the feature array. It is uh, labeled encoded because uh, the Lime Explainer takes only numerical data. So it's a uh, required pre-processing step. And this is the class labels, target labels. And we are doing exactly the same as before. We are, uh, convert we are creating train and test data sets. Uh, in Scikit-Learn, there's a feature called Label Encoder, where you give a column of features and it will analyze each distinct value and map it into a number. Uh, so we have created uh, train test splits and uh, we also need to one-hot encode uh, the values because uh, the classifier does not take uh, categorical features as uh, continuous features. Uh, and after uh, executing this encoding, our model, our data, uh, data size, uh, data frame size will rapidly grow. So uh, let's, uh, let's run the random forest on this data. It takes uh, a little bit longer and uh, test it on the testing data. We have 100% accuracy and there is the same object uh, line uh, function line tabular explainer. Uh, it takes uh, 
slightly various parameters uh, than previous example, class names, feature names, categorical features and categorical names. And to uh, run the uh, uh, explanation, we have to do one more additional step, create a helper function for predicting probabilities for each uh, next instance, but we also make sure that this instance is uh, one hot encoded before making the predictions. So here's my helper function, I will define it and uh, use it here for explaining new instance. And like in the previous example, we are randomly choosing uh, one candidate. Okay. And the output is very similar. We have uh, selected one mushroom. Uh, it is 100% poisonous. And here are the main reasons why it is poisonous. With the imp relative importance. These are the reasons for being poisonous. These are the reasons for being edible. Okay, and finally, uh, how it works with numerical and categorical data. In this example, there is also a data set from the UCI called adult data. It contains information about different person and the task is to predict whether a person will make more than $50,000 per year or not. So uh, it is also a, some uh, loading data step. Like before, training testing, one hot encoding, only for categorical columns. I have mainly specified them here. Okay. Here you can see the shape of the data set. We have uh, for training 26,000 rows, uh, 108 columns. So it's quite a big data set. I'm not using random forest here because it will be obviously too slow. I'm using XGBoost algorithm. Okay, we are calculating probabilities, uh, uh, accuracy metrics, 87%, creating the explainer like in the previous example, helper function, and explaining predictions. As you can see, uh, it works both with uh, numerical value and categorical ones.